Coming in at number five, we've got deep blue sharks. You could make an argument that these are just normal sharks, but that argument would be wrong. It would be like saying that the shark from Jaws was just a regular shark. And not even Bruce had the brain capacity to take down an entire aquatic research facility. Let's take a look. The 1999 shark attack thriller Deep Blue Sea was met with mixed reviews, largely due to its heavy use of B-movie plot points. Don't get me wrong, B-movie plot points make the world go round, but listen to this. In Deep Blue Sea, there's a research team trying to find a way to reactivate brain cells affected by Alzheimer's disease. For whatever reason, the scientists landed on using Mako sharks. What makes a shark brain special? Who knows? So these Alzheimer's sharks are hanging out in some holding tanks, having brain tissue removed and so on. Then one wakes up, bites a man's arm off, and then yanks a helicopter out of the air. Huh. As it turns out, these scientists have genetically modified these sharks to have bigger brains in order to ensure they can harvest enough gray matter to do their research. And these bigger brains have enabled the dead-eyed predators to become smarter and more deadly than ever. How do they even manage that? You can just make brains bigger now? Imagine that, making a shark so smart that it could take your place in the food chain. Incredible stuff. Following this reveal, these sharks are nothing but bad news. They kill plenty of people, all while sabotaging control panels, cutting off exits, and generally making a big mess of the research facility. Those big brains really get put to work. So if you didn't already have this recurring nightmare, you can now add brainy fish to your laundry list of fears. Coming in at number four, we've got Umibozu. We'll take a quick break from movie monsters for a moment and examine a terrifying mythological monster. This sea spirit is included in the ever-interesting category of Japanese creatures known as yokai. It will appear when waters are at their calmest and absolutely wreck ships. Isn't that just cruel? When the going is easy, it decides to provide its own type of storm. They appear to be large black humanoid figures. Different sizes have been sighted, but they're often tens of meters tall. Legends may vary by location, but a common story is that of an umibozu rising from the water and demanding a bucket or barrel from the sailors. If you hand it one of these containers, it will then drown you. It's been said that the only way to escape one, if it doesn't wreck your ship immediately, is to hand it a bottomless barrel and sail away when it's confused. Many people believe that Umibozu sightings are simply the result of seafaring folk incorrectly seeing other naturally occurring phenomena. It could very well be clouds or other large sea organisms. Still, you don't want to take any chances with giant paranormal monsters. The origins of the Umibozu are murky at best, and there are no stories that clearly depict its creation or first appearance. However, some say that they are the spirits of dead priests that were tossed into the waters. Their bodies have nowhere to rest, so their souls haunt the ocean, dooming anyone who crosses them. Sheesh. Coming in at number three, we've got Gilman, also known as the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's hard to look at this classic creature nowadays without conjuring up the many, many other beasts that paid homage. Swamp Thing, Davy Jones's crew, and of course, the amphibian man from The Shape of Water. Hollywood was shaped by this slimy, girl-chasing man-beast. Sure, it seems campy and done to death at this point, but way back when, it was a thrilling icon. After discovering a fossil linking land and sea animals, a team of researchers decide to stick around in the Amazon to find more. When the leader leaves camp, Gilman appears. Green and greasy and curious as a child, he infiltrates the camp and kills two expedition members in self-defense. And thus begins a strange game of cat and mouse, or researcher and monster and beautiful woman. Gilman has the ability to overpower just about any human in a fight, to swim at unheard of speeds, and of course to breathe underwater. All of this combined with a lust for human female makes him a terrible beast indeed. Sure, it can be argued that Gilman is just misunderstood, an idea that Guillermo del Toro would later explore in more detail, but for the average moviegoer and upholder of the status quo, it was a terrifying beast indeed. The rubber suit may be cheesy, but it's stuck in the collective minds of theater attendees around the world. Coming in at number two, we've got The Host. Before Parasite, Bong Joon-ho was still putting out movie after masterful movie. In some way or another, they were all about monsters too. Memories of Murder was about a boogeyman, Snowpiercer was about men who would exploit all sorts of people to keep a semblance of order, Okja was about the ever-ravenous food industry. But looking at The Host, it's a movie about a literal monster, and that's pretty much it. There's plenty of commentary about other things in the world, like how the powers that be can be straight up evil, and about how war can have lingering effects long after conflict ends, and also about how the youngest and weakest of us need to be protected. But in the end, The Host is just a crazy monster movie, and the monster is awesome. Apparently it was based on Steve Buscemi, too. Who would've thunk? This slimy, bipedal, prehensile, tailed beast runs throughout urban Korea, swallowing people whole and disappearing into the water like it's nothing. People unload entire magazines of bullets into it, shoot at it with sporting bows, toss molotovs, and even unleash terrifying chemical agents, and it still runs around eating children. 
It's a freaky, straightforward monster with a million slippery folds making up its mouth. And at any given moment, it might regurgitate any number of things. Even if the 2006 era digital effects don't quite hold up, it's still fascinating to look at. And finally, at number one, we've got Godzilla. Come on, you didn't think I'd leave the granddaddy of all kaiju off this list, did ya? Walking straight up out of the ocean to level entire cities, Godzilla is the archetypal aquatic monster. The roar, iconic. The silhouette, iconic. The destruction, iconic. Without Godzilla, we wouldn't have any other kaiju either. Say bye-bye to the ocean-spawning beasts from Pacific Rim. Sayonara to all the crazy monsters the Super Sentai and Power Rangers fight. Bye-bye to the Cloverfields, Gameras, and Mega Sharks. Godzilla is the aquatic monster. A prehistoric sea creature given power by nuclear radiation, this upright reptilian is a force to be reckoned with. Described by a doctor in the original film as a transitional creature somewhere between marine and terrestrial, there's nowhere to hide from Godzilla. It's taken many forms over the years, but retains most of its classic features. The furrowed brow, rough scales, long tail, and enormous legs. Sometimes it even takes a while to evolve to that point, like in Shin Godzilla. It has atomic breath, which it uses to vaporize anything it wants. Different iterations feature magnetism, fireballs, laser beams, flying, and electric bites, too. So if you're ready for one form of Godzilla, there's dozens more waiting in the wings to test the populace in new, destructive ways. King of the monsters, right? Who wants to go for a swim? Nobody? Huh. I guess all this talk of aquatic monster madness has made taking a dip a little less appealing, eh? My bad. Coming in at number five, we've got Grabbers from Grabbers. <laughs> There should be a more scientific name for these brutes, but I haven't heard an accurate description yet. Well, not more accurate than grabbers, anyways. They're weird, fleshy masses of tentacles and blood-sucking tongues who kill whatever they can get their tendrils on. At first, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. They take down a bunch of whales and lay some eggs in the sand, but they only subsist on blood and water, so there's no way they could make it on land and kill a bunch of folks. Right? Well, unless they show up on a remote, rainy Irish island, and then they can flop around to their greasy little heart's content, now couldn't they? Uh-oh. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from little floppy baby ones that might end up attached to you like an oversized leech, to mid-sized mama ones who could hypothetically drain all the blood from you after grabbing your head, to gigantic, truck-sized, swirling balls of limbs who can tear vehicles apart and swallow people whole. Yeesh. And they're rolling out of the water? That's bad news. The one saving grace is that they're so purely dependent on blood and water that alcohol can really mess them up. Feeding them booze straight up is a bit of a challenge though, considering they're extremely aggressive predators, but there's a workaround. If your blood alcohol level is high enough, they won't want to drink it. And if they do, they'll get knocked the fuck out. Classic. I always knew drinking in excess would save my life someday. These rules don't apply to other horror movies, unfortunately. You drink too much, you probably get stabbed. Oh, and the big ones can definitely still kill you even if you're plastered. Yeah, they might just slap you to kingdom come with one of their many tree-sized tentacles. Maybe postpone the Irish vacation until all the beaches are cleared of eggs, eh? Hey, if you're liking this video so far, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. It really helps us with the algorithm. Let's keep it moving. Coming in at number four, we've got Becky and Harry from Creep Show. Can you hold your breath for a long time? Because if not, you'd better get to training. Because if you ever run into a ruthless rich man, or if you ever become one, you might find yourself neck deep in sand and watching the tide come in. <laughs> This one comes from the short Something to Tide You Over. Of course, the millionaire himself, Richard Vickers, is only the beginning of this aquatic horror story. After finding out that his wife Becky has been unfaithful to him, Richard lures her lover, Harry, out to a secluded beach and buries him alive at gunpoint. Becky gets buried too, and they're all connected by CCTVs. Richard heads back up to his luxurious estate and watches the two panic as the tide inches closer and closer. But hey, if they can hold their breath long enough, they might be able to wriggle out once the water covers them and loosens the sand. Eesh. Well, they do find a way to get free but not as living, dry human beings. No, they come back as waterlogged, revenge-seeking seaweed people. Guns can't hurt them. Punches can't hurt them. They can't be stopped. And they stink of seawater and rotten fish. Becky and Harry, together forever, rotting and sloshing. Yuck. They do indeed get their revenge, too. They bury old Richard neck deep in sand, letting him experience the same fate they did. 
But remember, if he can hold his breath for a really long time, maybe he'll find a way out. Or maybe, just maybe, he'll end up waterlogged and revenge-fueled too. Such classic horror themes here, eh? You reap what you sow, you can't get away with everything. Coming in number three, we've got the creature from Leviathan. Widely underappreciated, Leviathan is a wonderful work of special effects mastery. The underwhelming plot might have something to do with its relatively small renown, but there are enough wicked scares and awesome creature moments to make up for that. The movie got a lot of flack when it was released for being really similar to Alien and The Thing, but who the hell considers that a bad thing? Moving on, let's talk about the creature itself. After an underwater mining crew comes across a scuttled Russian ship, Leviathan, things start to go sideways. After two of the crew succumb to extremely strange circumstances, it becomes apparent that the Russian crew from the Leviathan had some weird stuff done to them. Something about mutagens and tainted vodka, for sure, but soon enough, the underwater mining crew starts seeing these strange effects. Whatever was in that booze is now out and about assimilating crew members. You'd think liquor was safe, but this isn't grabbers. It starts small, but manages to remain terrifying and fascinating throughout every possible iteration. The transformation this creature goes through are incredible. Like, it's a shame more folks don't watch this movie just for the practical effects. There's a slimy lamprey version that eats its way inside a man and then becomes a terrible tentacle beast. It manages to spread even further, infecting more folks with even more eye-popping mutations. Eventually, we have a full-blown flesh-and-blood alien monster thrashing around in the underwater station. It even manages to pop up to the surface and attempt to drown the folks who escaped. They just don't make them like this anymore. Coming in at number two, we've got Dagon from Dagon. Ah, the classic monster from the deep. Originating from the Lovecraftian canon, Dagon is a deity who rules over the Deep One. The folks of Innsmouth worship him, people outside the town fear him, and of course he makes a terrifying appearance in a Stuart Gordon Lovecraft adaptation. I wish I never see. Innsmouth is exchanged for Imboka, though, and the esoteric order isn't named as such, but the terrifying nature of the beast remains. After falling on hard times, the villages of Imboka are convinced to worship Dagon instead of God. This allows them to return to prosperity, but at the cost of blood sacrifices. Dagon demands human women to breed with, until all the regular humans die off, leaving only the half-human, half-sea creature abominations to populate the village. These creatures are horrid in their own special ways, with slimy fish heads and awful screeches galore. None of the lesser beings compared to the big bad himself though. While only making brief appearances in the movie, Dagon's presence is overwhelming. He permeates every aspect of the sleepy, creepy village as our protagonists discover more and more awful details. The sacrifices and rituals he demands are pretty filthy too. Skin flaying is just the beginning, but it's also shown in full gruesome detail. Lovecraftian creatures thrive on our own fears and being beyond comprehension. Dagon's effect on the humans that come into contact with him is scary in its own special way, even if we never really see the entire creature. Creature. And coming in at number one, we've got Cthulhu from Underwater. And speaking of Lovecraftian creatures, why not cap off the list with the legendary Great Dreamer himself? That's right, we are talking about one of the biggest, baddest creatures out there. Somehow awakened for a guest appearance at the end of this recent aquatic horror flick underwater. The Great Old One is truly magnificent. For most of the movie, the audience doesn't even know it's Cthulhu. It's a secret Lovecraft story, says director William Eubanks, and some folks don't quite pick up on that fact. But still, it's Cthulhu in all of his ghastly glory. An underwater drilling facility is badly damaged following a wicked earthquake at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. First of all, what are you doing down there? It's not worth it. Things only get worse from there, with strange creatures dragging folks into the murky depths on top of the inherent water pressure threat. The little beasts take all sorts of forms, from unrecognizable masses to vaguely humanoid shapes. But of course, the most terrifying monster of all is the enormous tentacled Great One. Cthulhu. He's the one who's been spawning all the smaller monsters, and he's pretty pissed that there are humans near his abode. Running into something so mind-bendingly horrible so deep underwater is a nightmare no matter how you look at it. And the worst part is, after everything happens, the mining and drilling efforts look like they're ready to expand. 
Who knows what they'll wake up next. And now we don't know if vodka will help or hurt us. Oh, the humanity. Coming in number five, we've got The Meg from The Meg. Sometimes I wonder how many shark movies actually exist and my brain overheats. Like ever since Jaws, there's been an obsession with gigantic sharp toothed fish flying through the water and eviscerating people. Sometimes they jump way out of the water, other times they manage to sneakily chew a limb or two off a swimmer. Hell, there's even been instances of them finding their way into a tornado or two. But the most recent big shark flick took the idea and supersized it, like quite literally too. While it might not be a horror movie by strict standards, it definitely delivers on the terrifying aquatic monster. This movie is all about a team of scientists who come across a whopping 75 foot long megalodon shark. That is the titular Meg. Could you imagine ever seeing a predator that was 75 feet long, especially in the dark murky depths of the ocean? Well, here's the thing, 75 feet is just the beginning. Spoilers for anyone who's really invested in this shark movie that came out two years ago. So after all sorts of crazy underwater antics, the crew manages to snag the Meg. They caught the thought to be extinct Mega Shark. Rejoice! But hold on, it's way too early for the shark to be done so. We're only like an hour into the movie. Well, if you thought there had to be more, you'd be right. While celebrating their catch, the crew witnesses something truly awe-inspiring. Another, bigger megalodon shark speeds its way onto the scene and eats the first one. After instilling a sense of awe in the audience early on with the original giant shark, they decide to blow those expectations out of the water with an even more enormous aquatic monster. Just awesome. Say what you will about the movie as a whole, there is nothing cool than a giant shark getting devoured by an even gianter shark. Coming in at number four, we've got Piranhas from Piranha 3D. For another journey into the land of absurdly sized fish, let's take a look at Piranha 3D. This is B-movie schlock at its peak. An earthquake opens up a chasm at the bottom of a lake, releasing thousands of ancient carnivorous fish just in time for spring break and they are hungry. They've been surviving via cannibalism for the two million years they've been assumed to be extinct, and they are ready for some fresh meat. Fresh human meat. These things are vicious. They tear people apart in seconds, leaving goofy little bloody skeletons behind. It's a sight to behold, for sure. I guess spending millions of years in an underground cavern void of light full of the remains of the brethren you just consumed makes you aggressive or something. Isn't that the backstory of the monsters in the descent? I'm getting off track here. Most movies use the anticipation of the monster to really sell the scares, but not Piranha 3D. These things go full tilt from the very beginning. They rise from the bottom of the lake and don't stop eating until the very end. And really, at the very end, they're still eating. Sure, the kills start small, but they grow by orders of magnitude. We open on a lone man being devoured, then we get a fishing boat, then some scuba divers bite the big one in the sky. Of course, the bit that everyone remembers is when the piranhas plow through a beach party. Thousands of lives extinguished. Just like that. Whirlpools of piranhas tear people apart with seemingly zero effort, followed by fish jumping out of the water to get at all the landlubbers. And the best part? Piranha did the bigger, badder thing before the Meg. That's right. The piranhas that take out an entire crop of spring breakers are actually babies. They're immature, only a fraction of the size of a full grown one. Then, as the movie ends, we catch a glimpse of a full sized piranha, bigger than a grown man. And there's more on the way. I love B-movies. Coming at number three, we've got the bioluminescent creature from Sea Fever. Our first two movies reveled in the bombastic, so let's slow it down for a second. Sea Fever is slow and suffocating in its application of aquatic terror. It really takes its time getting under your skin, but boy, when the fear strikes, it strikes big. It's one of those movies where you're never quite sure if what you think is happening is actually happening, but plenty of clues keep the tension high. Siobhan, a reclusive scientist, finds herself on an Irish fishing trawler heading out to sea. The captain steers the ship towards an exclusion zone, knowing that there are plenty of fish out there, even if it's off limits. He doesn't tell the rest of the crew though, leaving them to assume that their big catch was just lucky and outside of the exclusion zone. The exclusion zone was erected for good reason though, as the folks aboard soon find out. During their journey, something stops their boat. Goopy, slimy breaches appear in the hull, and whatever's causing them continues to hold the boat in place. Thinking it's a shoal or something similar, Siobhan hops off the side to do a research dive and discovers the culprit. Glowing tentacles originating from a gigantic organism way down below. It is so vast that she cannot see the full form of it from where she is. After their encounter with these strange tendrils, the boat is freed and off they go. But that's just the beginning. See, the big creature manages to infect a crewmate by cutting his hand, injecting larva into his bloodstream. He starts acting weird, and at first the captain chalks it up to sea fever, you know, when you're stuck on a boat, you start going a little crazy. Too late though, because this guy's eyes explode out of his head, and the more mature larva make it into the ship's water supply. 
Anyone could be infected at that point. The bioluminescent creature manages to be incredibly scary while also somewhat sympathetic. It's just an unknown animal doing its best to survive as animals do. They shouldn't have been in the exclusion zone anyway. Although the monster isn't really a virus, sea fever manages to be extremely painfully prescient, as folks want to leave quarantine to get help, without considering that they could cause so many more problems in doing so. Coming in at number 2, we've got the creatures from the beach house. Now if you really want to get Lovecrafty in with your aquatic monsters, you gotta head down to the beach house. If an aquatic creature is bioluminescent, it probably means that we as humans were never meant to see it. They come from the deep, deep depths, and encountering anything like that is probably the result of hubris. In the beach house, a young couple heads down to a beach house for some time off. They find that a couple of family friends are there all ready to have one last vacation before terminal illness takes hold of the wife. After eating some edibles, everyone has a weird experience involving water quality, fog, glowing stuff and more. These oddities are assumed to be side effects to the consuming of marijuana, so nobody thinks too much about it. The morning after has a different story to tell though. The beach is empty, save for some strange jellyfish, and everyone seems to have sustained odd injuries. The older couple, Mitch and Jane, are acting very strange, with Mitch walking into the water and not returning, and Jane remaining in a catatonic state. Soon it becomes apparent that something is very wrong with the jellyfish seeming to infect people, turning them into flesh hungry zombies. They send little bugs skittering and slithering into people's open wounds, and if you don't rip them out quick enough, you'll end up as a milky eyed automaton. In addition to the jellyfish and bugs, there's also an infectious fog that will do similar things to people's minds and bodies. Not ideal. Whatever these beings are, they've fundamentally changed life on Earth in the Beach House's world. If you're a fan of the color out of space, you'll appreciate this one. And finally at number one, we've got Bruce from Jaws. Easy number one pick, right? You can't go wrong with this shark infested classic. Jaws set the standard for every shark movie to follow and hasn't ever been matched. Not to mention that it literally birthed the blockbuster. Plus it scared people out of swimming, boating, and in some cases bathing for ages. It inspired folks to get out on the water and kill sharks for sport, which led to some terrible problems with the shark population. That's how much sway it had. The influence this aquatic monster had on the hearts and minds of people is insane to say the least. In addition to branding the image of a gigantic horrible shark into the brains of every man, woman, and child, it also managed to be very restrained with its implementation of the underwater apex predator. Sure, it was probably thanks to plenty of malfunctions in the shark animatronic, but rarely actually seeing the shark really ups the white knuckle tension. That and the iconic strings. To this day, people know exactly what you're talking about if you sing. Da -dun, da -dun. Dun, 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 dun. People who haven't seen Jaws know that that means a shark is coming. Phenomenal stuff. Plus, Jaws stays socially relevant. Consider the implications of closing down the beach and therefore business on Amity Island versus what's happening as a result of this pandemic. It might seem like I'm reaching, but the comparison stands. Jaws will never get stale. Good thing winter's coming, that'll keep you away from the water for a little while. No swimming means no shark attacks, right? Or unknown glowing monster attacks, or piranha attacks. You get what I'm trying to say. Coming in at 5, Umabozu. Umabozu is a paranormal phenomena or yokai from Japanese folklore. Little is known of the origin of Umbozu, but it is a sea spirit and as such has multiple sightings throughout Japan. Typically, Umbozu appears to sailors on calm seas, which quickly turns tumultuous, it either breaks the ship on emergence or demands a bucket or barrel from the sailors and proceeds to drown them. The only safe way to escape an umbozu is to give it bottomless barrel and sail away while it is confused. They appear and disappear in the oceans often at night and it is thought that they would suddenly appear on what was previously a calm sea surface as a giant black bozu head and destroy ships. In the Tohoku region there is a custom of sacrificing to the gods the first fish caught when fishing and it is said that if this is not followed an umbozu would appear and destroy the boat and kidnap the boat owner. They are also said to change their appearance and in Kesanuma, Oshima, Miyagi prefecture there are tales of them shapeshifting into a beautiful woman and engaging in swimming contests with humans. Odd. Outside of Japan, they are half human legends about sea monks and sea bishops related to the Mbuzu. Coming in at number four, Ikuturso. Ikuturso, meaning the eternal Tursu, also known as Ikutursus, is a malevolent sea monster in Finnish mythology. As of now, Meritorus means octopus in Finnish, named after Ikuturso, but originally Turus is an old name for walrus. This aquatic creature's appearance remains unclear. But he is described with several epithets. Partalainen, the one who lives on the brink, or alternatively, the bearded one. Tuonen Haka, the ox of Tuoni death. Tutapa, thousand head. 
to Hatsavi Thousand Haunt. It was also sometimes said that he lived in Pojola, but that could also be because Pojola was believed to be home of all evil. In some cases, Ikuturso is mentioned as the father of diseases, with Lovete, the blind daughter of Tuoni, the god of death. In the world of Lovecraft, the Ikuturso was a great old one who ruled over the area of Finland until he, alongside the other old ones, was sung into the swamps by Finnish sages and poets who had learned these abilities from the Sami people. Around the 1930s, author Mats W. Cornelius, who was a correspondent of H.P. Lovecraft, wrote stories in which he compared Ikuturso with the great old one Cthulhu. The creature is mentioned several times in the Finnish national epic. Kalevala, I quote, From the ocean rose a giant mighty Tursa, tall and hairy, pressed compactly all the grasses that the maidens had been raking. When a fire within them kindles and the flame shot up to heaven, till the windows burned to ashes, only ashes now remaining. Of the grasses raked together in the ashes of the windows, tender leaves the giant places in the leaves he plants an acorn. From the acorn quickly sprouting grows the oak tree tall and stately. From the ground enriched by ashes newly raked by water maidens. Spread the oak tree's many branches rounds itself a broad corona, raises it above the storm clouds. Far it stretches out its branches, stops the white clouds in their courses. With its branches hides the sunlight, with its many leaves the moonbeams, and the starlight dies in heaven. Coming in at number 3, Karen Crowen. Kieran Crown was a large sea monster in Scottish Gaelic folklore, famous from one specific saying. I quote: Seven herrings, a salmon's fill; seven salmon, a seal's fill; seven seals, a large whale's fill; seven whales, a Kieran Crowan's fill. Local folklore say this huge animal can disguise itself as a small silver fish when fishermen come in contact with it. Other accounts state the reason for the disguise was to attract its next meal. When the fisherman would watch it in its small silverfish form, once aboard it changed back to the monster and ate him. The creature has a typical water dragon or serpent shape that is vicious and terrifying, consuming anyone who crosses its path. Also sorry this point was so short, it's literally because Kieran Crowen has no information about it. You can check. Coming in at number 2, Ningen. Over the past few years, rumours have circulated about the existence of arctic humanoid lifeforms known as Ningen, inhabiting the icy waters of the Antarctic. It has reportedly been observed multiple times by crew members on whale research ships, and these so called Ningen, meaning human, are said to be completely white in colour with an estimated length of 20 to 30 metres. Other eyewitnesses describe them as having a human like shape, often with legs, arms, and even five fingered hands. Other times, they are described as having fins or a large mermaid like tail instead of legs or even tentacles. Now the only visible identifiable facial features are the eyes and mouth. According to one particular account, crew members on deck observed what they thought was a foreign submarine in the distance. When they approached, however, it became clear from the irregular shape of the thing that it was not man-made, it was alive. It then disappeared under the surface of the water. These Ningen stories garnered attention with an article being printed about the Antarctic humans, with the article speculating on the possibility of unidentified creatures inhabiting the southern sea. Sadly, to date, no solid evidence has been presented to confirm the existence of the Ningen. Sightings still occur to this day though, most frequently at night, making them all the more difficult to photograph. Whether they are dangerous, we have no idea, however they are absolutely terrifying to look at, which is why they make it to number 2. And finally coming in at number 1, Leviathan. The Leviathan is a sea serpent monster of immense size from Jewish belief, referenced in the Hebrew Bible and the book of Job. So and the book of Isaiah, and the book of Amos. The Leviathan of the Middle Ages was used as an image of Satan, endangering both God's creatures by attempting to eat them, and God's creation by threatening it with upheaval in the waters of chaos. St. Thomas Aquinas described the Leviathan as the demon of envy, first in punishing the corresponding sinners. It is also classified as one of the seven princes of hell, corresponding to the seven deadly sins. In Judaism, sources describe the Leviathan as a dragon who lives over the source of the deep, and who, along with the male land monster Behemoth, will be served up to the righteous at the end of time. I quote, The sea monsters, the great fish in the sea, and in the words of the Agada, this refers to the Leviathan and its mate, for he created the male and female, and he slew the female and salted her away for the righteous in the future. For if they would propagate, the world could not exist because of them. According to sources, the body of the Leviathan, especially his eyes, possesses great illuminating power. This was the 
opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who in the course of the voyage in company with Rabbi Joshua, explained to the latter, when frightened by the sudden appearance of a brilliant light, that it probably proceeded from the eyes of the Leviathan. In modern usage however, the term Leviathan has come to refer to anything, specifically any sea monster and from the early 17th century has also been used to refer to overwhelmingly powerful people or things, including Moby Dick. Coming in at number 5, SCP-3700. 3700 is the designation for a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers, encompassing the archipelagos of Faroe. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Orkney and Shetland. It has an abnormal depth, with the seafloor located 5 kilometers below the ocean surface compared to an average 250 to 300 meters for the rest of the North Sea. This SCP is subject to a wide and varied array of anomalous occurrences due to ritualistic interactions between two entities, which have been designated SCP 3701 and SCP 3702. Effects of SCP 3700 are entirely highly dependent on which entity successfully subdues the other during each ritual. All rituals, with the exception of two consistent dates, take place at random periods of time. SCP-3701 and 2 always interact on dates corresponding with the spring and fall equinox of the given year. Now, the specific interactions between 1 and 2 consist of prolonged struggle where each entity will attempt to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Interactions on equinox dates are usually short and can occur in random locations, with the victor of the previous interactions quickly dispatching the other entity. Now here's where things get really, really interesting. Successful defeat of one entity by the other induces a number of different geological and meteorological changes within the 800 km zone. When SCP-3701 subdues two, storms and harsh weather are immediately dispelled. Reproductive rates of local oceanic and island fauna increase by a factor of 3. Three. Erosion rates increase by a factor of 5. When SCP-3702 subdues 1, meteorological conditions become perilous. Continuous storms ranging in strength from category 1 to 5 hurricanes occur. Travel by sea is near impossible. Ocean food sources are driven from the area due to the extreme condition. Yikes, pretty rough. As of right now, Foundation Naval Task Force Delta 7 is currently assigned to patrol the area. Coming in at number 4, SCP-835. 835 appears to be a large mass of coral like polyps weighing an unknown amount. The polyps are larger than any known coral species, growing to more than 1 meter in diameter in some cases. The central mass is roughly oval shaped with a very large polyp at each end. This SCP is incapable of locomotion and appears to anchor itself with the large tentacles projected from the SCP 835 polyps. Now, these are also used in feeding and are coated with a sticky adhesive substance. The tentacles are also quite strong and have been shown to be capable of damaging plate steel. That's pretty scary. The coral itself is extremely hard, requiring high powered diamond drills to collect even small samples. 835 also grows at a very accelerated rate, capable of adding 50 pounds of mass every single day. Not just that, but it is also susceptible to many chemicals, which in turn causes 835 to seal up and halt all growth for 24 hours, prompting development and use of suppression tactic AA6. It is also known to emit a large mass of liquidy material several times a day from the large polyps on each end. This appears to be made of semi-digested solids, fecal material and semen. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. As of right now, 835 is to be monitored and checked daily for new growth. In the event 835 becomes hostile, suppression tactic AA6 is to be immediately implemented until aggressive action ceases. The containment area must be maintained in open ocean due to the highly aggressive response of 835 to confinement for any length of time. Coming in at number 3, SCP-3934. 3934 is a species of amphibious reptiles produced via anomalous means by Marshall Carter and Dark LLP. Essentially, this SCP is the Loch Ness Monster, kinda. 
Instances of 3934, classified as Plesiosaurus pygmius, grow to only just over half the size of other plesiosaurs, with adult males average 1.9 meters in length and adult females averaging 1.7 meters. These specimens are omnivorous and subsist on a diet of fish and aquatic flora. Now, 3934 were originally created in the early 20th century by M, C, and D with the intent to sell instances as exotic pets or aquarium denizens. M, C, and D capitalized on the legend's popularity to sell specimens to numerous wealthy individuals of noble or industrial background in both Europe and the United States. Between 1935 and present, an estimated 1200 to 1400 SCP-3934 instances have been created and sold. They are said to be highly social animals, both with members of their own species and with humans. Now, Although they are generally friendly, abandoned instances of 3934 often react with uncharacteristic violence towards humans and other mammals. As of right now, a part of 59 SCP-3934 instances is currently contained within Site-220's Parazoology Reserve. Coming in at 2, SCP-2846. SCP-2846 is a massive aquatic octopoid entity, currently estimated to be at least 955 to 990 meters in length. It collectively refers to a set of phenomenon occurring within the Gulf Atlantic region of the Atlantic Ocean. This entity is known to appear from deep water during storms within the Gulf Atlantic region and attack civilian vessels, specifically cruise liners or merchant ships. Now, now, 2846A's attacks are sporadic and often occur quickly and without prior warning. Foundation assets in the region have utilized United States Navy deep sea radar wells to more accurately detect the appearance of SCP 2846A, though this has only provided, on average, an additional five minutes of preparation. Now, SCP 2846B is a large seafaring vessel that appears during A's appearance events. This vessel, which appears to be Pennsylvania class. Super Dreadnought Battleship also appears from deep water before surfacing at the location of an SCP 2846A appearance event. A is believed to be an entity that has existed for potentially thousands of years, although information confirming this is scarce. Mobile Task Force Tau QQ on board the SCP's Nikolai are to maintain a perimeter around active 2846 activation areas. In the event of an SCP 2846A appearance event, MTF T11 is to utilize the Kensington Barryman high power transmitting device to communicate with SCP 2846B and then to maintain contact contact with B throughout the engagement. And finally coming in at number 1, SCP-1451. 1451 is a set of metal statues, 26 in total, which are individually referred to as SCP-1451. 1 through 26, which all appear to be of children with heights ranging from 1.32 meters to 1.43 meters. 1451 can be in three distinct states of motion, referred to as class 1 to 3 scenarios. During a class 1 scenario, no movement is detected. This state is the most ideal for containment. During both class 1 and class 2 scenarios, SCP 1451 are standing in a circle, each one grasping the hands of the statues adjacent to them and facing outwards. During a in a class 2 scenario, 1451 will animate slightly, shifting themselves with the apparent goal of counterclockwise locomotion. The hands on SCP-1451 will also raise and lower slightly during these moments. Bubbles can also be seen emanating from the mouths as well. Now, This state must be closely monitored as it can very quickly transition into class Three scenario. When a solid object with a mass greater than 40G enters the center of the circle, 1451 will animate and attempt to destroy said object. This is class 3. 1451 has shown remarkable strength and agility in the past, so the extent of these qualities has not been found. As of right now, 1451 is contained in Area 15 and is surrounded by a sphere of wire mesh to ensure that no large objects can enter the containment, aka humans who could potentially potentially meet their end. Access is denied to all persons attempting to enter regardless of rank. Coming in at number 5 we've got SCP-5320. You know when an inside joke goes a little too far and starts to alienate the folks around you? Yeah, well that's kinda what went on with this SCP, except the inside joke had to do with a fish that never seems to end and the weird cult that it spawned. When your top researchers are essentially 
posting and creating pointless rituals instead of doing their job, somebody's got to step in. So even though this is a relatively harmless aquatic monster in and of itself, there are a lot of things that it could do to cause problems without ever leaving the comfort of the deep sea. As of right now, this creature is being described as an increasingly long snailfish, although no drones have ever been able to locate a head or tail. It's just all middle. The longer you look at it though, the worse things get. I'm talking about developing new obsessions and being more superstitious than ever. All because of an extra long fish, or as the folks associated with the church of the fish that just goes on forever like to call it, our merciful and long lord, or its glorious infinitude, hail its everlasting fish body. Additional side effects of viewing SCP-5320 include a heightened awareness of the passage of time, increased interest in ceiling tile number, and increased use of the phrase long boy in casual conversation even when referring to things that are neither long nor a boy. Personnel monitoring SCP-5320 have reported feeling an unusual amount of excitement upon seeing one of SCP-5320's occasionally visible fins, as well as a compulsion to loudly cheer. This odd behavior concerning those who were all for the fish raised some red flags with the higher ups of the foundation. They launched an investigation to see if anything info hazardous was actually going on and the results are inconclusive at best. It seems that all this can be explained away by saying folks tend to get involved with silly superstitions and inside jokes, especially when they're working on something boring for an extended period of time. But it could also be that the fish is info hazardous and drawing more people under its influence by convincing anyone who looks at it that it's all just goofery. I'd keep a close eye on anyone involved with the long lord himself, and even those only tangentially related to it. Coming in at number 4 we've got SCP-1836. Be careful while roaming the seas, you never know what you could run into. And hell, there are a lot of things out there that have been around a lot longer than us and probably have more claim to the stuff that lives in the ocean. We as modern humans often believe we can just do what we want with no consequences. This as we're finding out quite quickly is not necessarily the case. Take SCP-1836 for example. An enormous iceberg located in the Cunningham Inlet, colored green and containing all sorts of anomalies. The green color actually doesn't have any anomalous properties, it's just trapped algae. But the rest of the stuff I mentioned, you better watch out. So there are two parts to note here. A mass of long extinct tooth cetaceans and a humanoid figure that hangs out in an open living room style cavern within the iceberg. Basically a bunch of dinosaur style dolphin ancestors and a goddess with super long hair. If you get sensed by the creatures of SCP-1836 and you are hunting or fishing in the area, they're coming to get you. The iceberg will accelerate towards the creature being hunted and said creature will somehow know to head towards the iceberg. When they get close enough to each other, the iceberg will get between the hunter and the hunted. At this point, all of the cetaceans will emerge from the berg and attack the hunting vessel. If nothing was killed by the time the iceberg arrives, the ship will simply be sunk. However, if the hunters were successful in taking down some prey, these ancient creatures will not be so generous. They'll snag anyone on board and pull them underwater, bringing them to caverns in the underside of the iceberg. Nobody who has suffered this fate has ever been heard from again. There's a lot more lore to this one concerning gods, haircuts, and shamans, but I'll leave that to you to explore. For now, we'll leave it at a magical moving iceberg full of ancient creatures that will sink any ship that threatens local wildlife. I'd say that's a pretty sweet SCP. Coming in at number 3, we've got SCP-1569. Anyone here ever been punched by a shrimp? No? Well, thank your lucky stars because that is the last thing you want. Especially when it's a massive, weirdly modified peacock mantis shrimp meant exclusively for punching extremely hard. I'm sure you've heard of a peacock mantis shrimp before. They're famous for being able to absolutely annihilate stuff in front of them with extremely fast punches. If you put a regular one in an aquarium, there's a good chance that it will smash the glass by displacing water in such a way that it creates like a shock wave. But when you get one as large as 1569, you you better believe it can cause a whole lot more damage. The big shrimp is 1 meter tall, 2 meters wide, and 9 meters long, and get this, its punch can strike with a force of up to 51,000 newtons. That would just vaporize someone, and imagine the shockwave. At first it appeared that this odd underwater entity had the intelligence of an average dog, and was content to just hang out with people. Sure it would go and absolutely pulverize some underwater prey from time to time, but other than that it just seemed like an extra powerful version of a creature that already existed. However, one day something weird happened. The shrimp went dormant and opened up like a living mech, and out popped the dude in competitive swimwear. And if I'm understanding the subsequent events correctly, this dude was essentially piloting this gigantic shrimp. Why? How? 
Was he the one acting like a dog? We may never know. But there is a special insignia on both the shrimp suit and the man inside, and it seems that there are some other strange connecting threads. Coming in at number two, we've got SCP-2770. No good deed goes unpunished, am I right? And this is especially true when you're out on the high seas and come across what appears to be a stranded man on an inflatable life raft. Most folks would head right over to help the poor castaway, right? But did any of them stop and think about why he might be out there in the first place? Oh boy. 2770 is a strange phenomenon where vessels spot what appear to be a poor unfortunate soul floating along on a yellow dinghy. It will appear and attempt to flag down manned vessels nearby, seemingly looking for rescue. If the vessel it targets does indeed come over to pick him up, it will initiate what's known as a boarding event. This is when an anomalous submarine will surface nearby and open its hatch. Once this hatch is open, it's game over. The rescuing vessel along with the dude in the raft will be pulled underwater at speeds upwards of 200 miles per hour, never to be seen again. Well, the castaway will appear again, but the other vessel? It's done. There doesn't seem to be a limit on the size of things that can get yanked underwater by this anomaly, and it has been seen pulling truly enormous ships to their doom. One time, the Foundation even scooped the stranded man up in a helicopter and brought him back to HQ, away from any large source of water. They thought they were so clever until they remembered the water table. The Foundation site he was brought to is no longer in operation. And finally, at number one, we've got SCP-169, the Leviathan. There's nothing quite like this in the sea, so you'd better watch out. Sailors and mariners have been talking about this creature for centuries. It's the stuff of legends. What else could inspire awe at such a level and survive for ages and ages? At this point, the foundation really has nothing they can do about it, so they just try and keep the legends, well, legendary. It measures somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 square kilometers and moves quite slowly under the water. Because it's so huge, there isn't really anything anyone can do about it. No structures can be built to contain it, and no weapons can be engineered to destroy it. Any satellite images of it shifting are to be destroyed. So sleep easy with the knowledge that it's been around longer than pretty much anything else on the surface of the planet and likely isn't going anywhere soon. Can't do anything about it, why worry? Coming in at number 5, SCP-054-FR. 054-FR is a phenomenon occurring in some waves off the western coasts as well as some eastern coasts. It is characterized by the physical transformation of effective waves to resemble the jaws of a great white shark. This SCP is capable of remaining unnoticed until it is almost too late to act. It is capable of forming on waves at least 4 meters tall, but the maximum height of which it can reach is unknown. Effective waves are capable of rolling at three times the speed of non-effective waves. If a non-aquatic animal of a human being is situated between SCP-054 and the closest coast, appearances of this SCP are growing considerably. If the previously evoked individuals are situated at a distance of at least 250 meters from the coast, whether they are swimmers, divers, or aquatic vehicles of moderate size, with the most common victims having been surfers. Injuries caused by SCP-054 are similar to that which could be accomplished by a great white shark, but with the pressure being directly proportional to the height of the affected wave. Injuries in 68% of cases occur during the collapse of the wave over the victim. Reported injuries have been as simple as a removed limb to total disappearance of the victim. The only method of avoiding injury is to dive under the wave before impact. An exclusion zone has been established around all shorelines where an occurrence of SCP-054-FR have been observed. Only personnel with a clearance level of 3 or higher may enter the containment zones, and only for experimental purposes. Access is forbidden to any and all civilians under the pretext of conducting research on a population of marine animals. Sneaky stuff, this is why I don't go in the ocean, ever. There's something lurking. Coming in at number 4, SCP-3389. SCP-3389 is a man-made lake located in the northeastern United States near the town of blank, Pennsylvania. Any human being entering SCP-3389 will, after a variable amount of time, not exceeding 10 minutes, be pulled beneath the surface of the water regardless of the depth at which they were standing. A few minutes after being submerged, a statue of the subject's exact likeness will rise from the water in their place. These statues are unremarkable beyond their anomalous origin, consisting of a synthetic resin and concrete mixture and given colour by standard household latex paint. Upon discovery by the foundation, 
excavation, there were at least 47 of these statues scattered around the lake, all in various states of decay. 13 currently remain, including that of a doctor. Doctor Blank. It is currently unknown how many instances are present prior to containment. Speaking of containment, all building private and public land in a 10 kilometer radius around SCP 3389 have been purchased by the foundation and designated provisional site 91. All roads and pedestrian pathways leading to the SCP are to be cordoned off and maintain a patrol of armed guards. An electrified chain link fence topped with barbed wire has been erected in the immediate vicinity surrounding 3389. Nine. Eight guard towers, each occupied by no less than two armed foundation personnel and equipped with security cameras, have been erected to watch over the SCP at all times. Back to the statue though, if any instances of the statues collapse, personnel stationed in the surrounding guard towers are to terminate any emerging statues instantly. No entities emerging from the lake are to reach beyond the chain link fence. If any personnel are apprehended by an instance of SCP-3389, every attempt is to be made to terminate them before they can be pulled into the water. Coming in at number 3, SCP-4217. 4217 refers to both the Bismarck, an anomalous German battleship sunk in 1941, and the large cephalopod organism that is fused to the inside of its hull. SCP-4217-B possesses a pair of octopoid eyes which protrude from the base of SCP-4217-A's superstructure and 12 100 to 200 meter long muscular hydrostats that extend from an opening in the stern. Now aside from the presence of SCP-4217-B, SCP-4217-A shows no signs whatsoever of damage sustained from battle or subsequent decades submerged underwater. B seemingly operates A systems. This includes its full armament of 8 main guns, 44 secondary guns and 12 anti-aircraft guns. B also can operate A's propellers to reach speeds approaching 40 knots but only while surfaced. This is way too much power for a creature to have and could be incredibly detrimental if you piss it off. While submerged, SCP-4217 achieves locomotion via ejection of water from B's body cavity. Typically, this SCP remains submerged at a depth of 500 to 1100 meters navigating its territory. However, the SCP will periodically surface and enter a hostile state. During this period, it will seek and attack non threatening targets. Now, Foundation naval forces are to patrol the SCP's territory with three or more battleships under the guise of the British Royal Navy. During a hostile state, naval forces are to engage with the SCP until it reverts to a passive state. Survivors from civilian vessels attacked by the SCP are to be recovered and processed in accordance with maritime. Disinformation protocols. Coming in at number two, SCP 1128. SCP 1128 is an entity that manifests as a massive aquatic predator to anyone given a full description of the being's appearance through the spoken, written descriptions or visual depictions of the being. Persons infected by SCP 1128 will initially exhibit no abnormal behavior, though some cases show a general aversion to activities involving bodily immersion in water such as bathing or swimming. Should subjects become fully emerged in water, they will disappear completely under the surface of the water regardless of the water's actual depth. In most cases, they will reappear moments later in a panic state and frantically try to leave the water. However, in other cases, the water will become polluted with blood and debris, confirmed to be the remains of the subject. That sucks. The subjects that reappear intact claim that they were transported to a vast ocean where they were pursued by SCP-11. Interviews with the surviving subjects carry further contamination as descriptions of the being's appearance trigger further infections. Yikes. Written description or imagery of the SCP's appearance or videos of the entity breaching found outside of the foundation are to be destroyed. And Class C amnestics are to be administered to anyone exposed to such information or showing signs of the SCP's contamination. A written description of the entity's appearance is to be kept at site blank for experimental purposes only and is not to be read by anyone other than D class used for testing. If exposed, staff are to report immediately for administration of class C amnestics. And finally, coming in at number one, SCP 3000. SCP 3000 is a massive aquatic serpentine entity strongly resembling a giant moray eel. The exact length of 3000 is impossible to determine, however, it is believed to be somewhere around 600 and 900 kilometers, with the head of SCP 3000 measuring roughly. 2.5 meters in diameter, and sections of the body proper being around 10 meters in diameter. Yeah, 
horrifying. Now 3000 is typically a sedentary creature only moving its head in response to certain stimuli or during feeding. The majority of its body is located around the Ganges fan and rarely moves at all. SCP-3000 is carnivorous and despite its sedentary nature is capable of moving quickly to dispatch prey aka us if we were ever to encounter it. Despite its size it is believed that SCP-3000 does not require sustenance to maintain its biological functions aka it kills for the hell of it. When 3000 consumes prey a thin layer of viscous dark grey substance classified as Y909 is excreted from its skin with the end result of its digestive processes currently unknown. In some historical records Dr Eugene gets reports on SCP-3000. I quote, The unease was felt throughout the entire crew as we descended on that first night. Whether this was due to our uncertainty at what we would discover or something more sinister I would not speculate. At around 0940 hours we first observed the head of the entity. The unease was palpable now. Several other crew members complained of feeling hazy and of being uncertain what they were supposed to be doing. When we were within 50 meters, the entity turned slowly to look at us. Even now, as I recall watching this thing coil around in the darkness, I can still hear Williams barking like a mad dog in the rear of the vessel, screaming and flailing, shouting about how he could see it in his head. Frightening stuff. The area containing SCP-3000, currently a region of the Bay of Begal, roughly 300 kilometers in diameter, is to be routinely patrolled by Foundation naval vessels. Under no circumstances are civilians allowed to attempt deep sea exploration or diving efforts in the quarantined area. Individuals believed to have contacted SCP-3000 are to be contained, quarantined and processed at Site 151. Sadly there is currently no known cure for exposure to 3000. As such, affected individuals should be contained and quarantined for further evaluation. Awful. In at 5, Sirens. Hailing from Greek mythology, sirens were supposedly dangerous creatures who according to the legend of Odysseus, the sirens would lure nearby sailors with their enchanting music and singing, which would cause them to shipwreck on the rocky coasts of the sirens island. The ships would be wrecked and the sailors aboard would perish, either by drowning or slain by the sirens themselves. However, what makes these creatures interesting is that whatever they did to their captives is unknown, but has been implied throughout mythology that they ate the unfortunate sailors. Savage. Now when Odysseus sailed towards the island housing the sirens, he ordered his crew to tie him to the mast so that he could hear the siren songs without being led astray. Smart mans. The crew were also ordered to plug their ears with beeswax so that they could not hear. In turn, Odysseus' ship passed safely by the island. Now these mythological monsters were believed to combine women and birds in various ways, often represented as birds with large female heads, bird feathers and scaly feet. However, throughout history this depiction would change, with them now being represented as female figures with the legs of birds, with or without wings, playing a variety of musical instruments, particularly harps. They have also been depicted as beautiful women whose bodies, not just their voices, are seductive. Now, According to Ovid, the sirens were the companions of a young Persephone. Demeter gave them wings to search for Persephone when she was abducted by Hades. However, Demeter would curse the sirens for failing to intervene in the Abduction and were ultimately fated to live only until their mortals, who heard their songs, were able to pass them by. In at four, your Manganda. Hailing from Norse mythology, your Manganda, meaning huge monster and also known as the Midgard world serpent, is a sea monster and the middle child of the giantess Angboda and Loki. Now, according to mythology, Odin took Loki's three children by Angboda, the wolf Fenrir, Hel, and your Manganda, and tossed the latter into the great ocean that encircles Midgard. The serpent then grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp its own tail. As a result of this, it received the name the World Serpent. When this monster releases its tail though, Ragnarok will begin. Frightening stuff. Once the beast releases its tail, the seas will become violent as the serpent thrashes its way onto land. Fenrir will set ablaze one half of the world with fireballs while Jormungandr sprays poison to fill the skies and seas of the other half. The two will then join the sons of must spell into the plain of Vigrid. Here is where the last meeting between the serpent and Thor is predicted to occur. Thor will become occupied with battling Jormungandr and they will be unable to help others as they fight their own battles. Thor however will eventually kill the serpent but will fall dead after walking just 9 paces having been poisoned by the serpent's deadly venom. 
tragic stuff. This dude is not to be messed with. In at three, the Kraken. The Kraken is a legendary sea monster hailing from Norse mythology and is a creature of enormous proportions, meaning an unhealthy or twisted animal. The Kraken was borrowed for one of the main antagonist monsters in Ray Harryhausen's Clash of the Titans. This creature is often described as a cephalopod and resembling a giant octopus or squid. The Kraken is said to emerge from the depths of the ocean and envelop whole ships in the grasp of its tentacles and drag them beneath the murky waters. Now most will remember this sea monster also making an appearance in the second installment of the Pirates of the Caribbean which featured a more mythologically accurate depiction of the Kraken as opposed to the 2010 remake of Clash of the Titans. Now its true mythological history goes something like this. After returning from Greenland an old Norwegian author described in detail the physical characteristics and feeding behaviour of the Kraken, proposing that there must be just two in all of existence, stemming from the observation that the beasts have always been sighted in the same parts of Greenland Sea and that each seemed incapable of reproduction, as there was seemingly no increase in their numbers. And while that fact may put some minds at ease, there is no denying the impact the Kraken has had on popular culture and sailors alike, with many fearing beneath those murky waters are elongated tentacles waiting patiently to feast. In at 2 Dagon Dagon is a deity who presides over the Deep Ones, an amphibious humanoid race indigenous to Earth's oceans. Now now this bad boy was first introduced in Lovecraft's short story Dagon, but is also mentioned extensively through the mythos. Also referred to as Father Dagon, he is a great old one and the consort of Mother Hydra. Now Dagon is huge, really huge, and could potentially reach a height of 50 feet. He is an enormous monster and is worshipped by the devout cult of humans and deep ones, who revere him as their deity. It is rumoured that he is immortal, however his longevity may be attributed to his fraternisation with the Starspawn, who will often select specimens from a given species to protect, nurture and empower for reasons only known to them. Now Dagon is aptly described in the short story, I quote, With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast polyphemus like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. This is not a beast you would want to stumble across on dark night. And finally in at number 1, Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic entity created by our favourite writer over here at Top 5 Scary, H.P. Lovecraft himself, and was first introduced in the short story The Call of Cthulhu, which, if you haven't read it, get on it immediately. Cthulhu is a great old one of great power that lies in the depth-like slumber beneath the Pacific Ocean in his sunken city of Rillier, and remains a dominant presence in the eldritch dealings on our world. Now it's near impossible to describe Cthulhu, however the most detailed descriptions come from the Call of Cthulhu and are based on statues of the creature. One of these statues, constructed by an artist after a series of baleful dreams, is said to have, I quote, yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon and a human character caricature, a pulpy tentacled head surmounted, a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings. Horrifying, right? Worse still, this oceanic monster has a loyal group of followers. It is unknown how large the throng of worshippers are, but his cult has many cells around the globe and are noted for chanting horrid phrases that translate to, I quote, In his house at Rillier, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. So, what happens when Cthulhu emerges from his slumber beneath the ocean? Well, the story says that, I quote, The thing cannot be described, but it is called the green sticky spawns of the stars, with flabby claws and an awful squid head with writhing feelers. All I can say folks is that if Cthulhu awakens there's trouble for not just you but for all of us. You have been warned. Coming in at number 5, Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a great old one of great power that lies in the depth like slumber beneath the Pacific Ocean in his sunken city of Rillier. To quote H.P. Lovecraft himself, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. The most detailed description of this hulking cosmic monster comes to us from the call of Cthulhu as well as statues of the creature constructed by an artist after a series of baleful dreams, is to have, I quote, yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon and a human caricature, a pulpy tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings. In The Call of Cthulhu, H.P. Lovecraft states that Cthulhu represents a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly rubbery looking body, prodigious claws on hind 
behind and four feet and long narrow wings behind. Castro, a Cthulhu cultist, reports that the great old ones are telepathic and knew all that was occurring in the universe. They were able to communicate with the first humans by molding their dreams, thus establishing the Cthulhu cult. But after Aurelia had sunk beneath the waves, I quote, the deep waters full of one primal mystery through which not even thought can pass had cut off the spectral intercourse. To quote H.P. Lovecraft's work at the Mountain of Madness, with the upheaval of new land in the South Pacific, tremendous events began. Another race, a land race of beings shaped like octopi and properly corresponding to the fabulous pre-human spawn of Cthulhu, soon began filtering down from cosmic infinity and precipitated a monstrous war which for time drove the old ones wholly back to the sea. Later peace was made and the new lands were given to the Cthulhu spawn whilst the old ones held the sea and the other lands. The Antarctic remained the centre of the old ones civilization, and all the discoverable cities built there by the Cthulhu spawn were blotted out. Then suddenly the lands of the Pacific sank again, taking with them the frightful stone city of Rillier and all the cosmic octopi so that the old ones were once again supreme on the planet. A lot to consume, I know and perhaps I'm slightly cheating with Cthulhu considering he is a land monster swallowed into the seas, but I did it and I'm glad. Don't fight me on this. You will lose. Coming in at number four, Chul. Chul are cosmic monsters that hail from the world of dungeons and dragons. The Chul can breathe air and water and can sense magic within 120 feet of it at will. I quote, I fought a Chul once. My sword bounced right off its carapace. It still has that sword and the arm I swung it with. They were large lobster-like aberrations with hatred for surface dwelling humanoids. The many tentacles that surround in their mouths were capable of causing paralysis with a single touch, thus leaving their unfortunate victim at the mercy of the Chul's powerful claws. Amphibious by nature, the Chul's were actually not great swimmers at the beginning, preferring to engage in combat either on land or very shallow water. They would often wait by a shoreline, while submerged or partially submerged in murky water, until it heard a suitable prey item, either within or without the water that it could perform a surprise attack upon. They were incredibly strong combatants, choosing to fight by grabbing and piercing their target with their enormous Claws. Much like a number of other deadly cosmic monsters, Chul's had psychic abilities. However, it was unusual for a young Chul to have access to such powers. Instead, they would gradually become able to exude psychic static as they aged. Older and larger creatures were able to emit a psychic moan that weakened resistance to psychic attacks and use a psychic lure to draw victims towards it. That's a lot of psychics. All in all, these dudes were deadly and were not to be messed with. And also, they're just downright terrifying to look at. Coming in at three, Mother. Hydra. Mother Hydra is yet another cosmic monster hailing from the mind of H.P. Lovecraft. It is a creature who, alongside her consort Father Dagon, is said to rule over the race commonly referred to as the Deep Ones. There has been a debate throughout time as to whether or not Mother Hydra is a lesser great old one or merely a grotesquely mutated Deep One, though the latter seems more likely as she doesn't seem to show much in the way of supernatural power. That is, outside of her gigantic size and long lifespan. Mother Hydra was also also one of the Wilmar Foundation's targets during Project X in March of 1980. The operation was ultimately unsuccessful and she was able to escape the partial destruction of the Deep One city outside Innsmouth Harbour, along with Father Dagon and Cathilla. Coming in at number two, Father Dagon, also known as Dagon, is yet another creature which appears in the H.P. Lovecraft inspired Cthulhu mythos. Father Dagon is a horrifically looking humanoid over 50 feet tall and resembles an enormously oversized deep one with a fish like face, flapping gills, and a scaled, slimy height. There is much debate over whether Dagon is a true great old one or simply a deep one grown to colossal proportions, as some deep ones continue to grow in size over the course of their life. Along with his consort, Mother Hydra, and great Cthulhu, Dagon is a member of the Deep One's Holy Trinity, the trio of beings worshipped as gods by the oceanic species. Not only that, but Cthulhu also entrusted the guardianship of his daughter Cthulhu to Dagon and Mother Hydra, and the pair are thought to hold watch over her in one of their great underwater cities somewhere in the North Atlantic. In addition to their following of Deep Ones, Dagon and Hydra are also worshipped by a cult of humans and human Deep One hybrids known as the Historic Order of Dagon. Like our last number, Dagon was one of the targets of the Wilmer Foundation's Project X in the early 1980s. The objective of the operation was to annihilate Father Dagon, Mother Hydra, and Cthulhu, but it was unsuccessful and the three escaped safely. And finally coming in at number one, Drowner of Hope. 
The Drowner of Hope is an Eldrazi, an ancient race native to the blind eternities that have neither physical form nor colour alignment. Their nature is ceaseless hunger, so they travel between planes, devouring the mana and life energy until the plane's destruction. Though each lineage has a distinct anatomy, each one of them seems to have commonality. A proboscis located somewhere near a joint acts as a feeding tube, attaching to a subject and draining them of life. Eldrazi proper and their infant spawns have no colour alignment and the mere presence of larger Eldrazi can cause reality to dissipate. However, Eldrazi drones born to serve the larger base species are often aligned. Now, What makes this race interesting is that they are genderless, lacking apparent biological sex and display no awareness of the concept of gender. They are also known to follow ley lines to move on a plane surface. Now, The Drowner of Hope was specifically created for the oceans and like I said, drains life from everything it touches. It doesn't get more terrifying than that. Number 5 on this list is Sinkhole Sam. The legend of Sinkhole Sam originated many years ago in Kansas. Sinkhole Sam is said to live in Inman Lake or as the locals call it, the Sinkhole. It's believed to be a 15 foot long serpent like creature that is as round and I quote, as an automobile tire. The people who claim that this serpent was 15 feet and round like an automobile tire are Albert Newfield and George Rager, two witnesses of the beast. These men are some of the many people who have stumbled upon this creature and have spoken out about it. Based on the reports, people believe that Sinkhole Sam is a type of prehistoric serpent that has managed to survive over the years. Now, Back before Kansas was even colonized, there were lakes and rivers all over the terrain making it a perfect spot for an animal like this to survive. As time went on, the area dried up and locals believed that Sinkhole Sam took up residence in Inman Lake. As the years have passed though, the sightings of Sam at Inman Lake have been fewer and farther between. However, the sightings of a similar creature at the Kingman State Lake have grown. This lake isn't too far from Inman Lake either, only 50 miles. 50 miles is certainly a long distance to go, but maybe not for a massive serpent like Sam. Sinkhole Sam, in my opinion, is one of the most likely creatures to actually exist. Unlike other sea beasts that are very far from any living animals that we have in our world, Sinkhole Sam, from most accounts, is just a big snake. I think it's super possible that someone has spotted a massive snake over the years in that lake, and through word of mouth, the story has been exaggerated over the time to become the legend of Sinkhole Sam. Now, If Sam is real then we should all be in the clear because even though a 15 foot serpent may be terrifying, there have been no reported attacks from Sinkhole Sam on humans since the legend began. Number 4 on this list is Leviathan Melville. This ancient beast is aptly named after the Leviathan due to its incredible size. This is a monstrous whale that grew from 45 feet to 60 feet in length. It has the largest teeth from any animal used to eat the world has ever seen, reaching a length of 1.18 feet. Their heads were 10 feet long and their jaws were absolutely massive. Similar to Megalodon, these creatures are long extinct and lived roughly 12 million years ago. Also similarly to Megalodon, they had the exact same diet as the massive shark, whales. That's right guys, this massive whale ate other smaller whales. Also because it was competing for the same food source as Megalodon, it's not unrealistic to think that those two creatures would have fought several times. And before I go any further about this beast, comment down below who you have in a fight, Megalodon or this leviathan of whales? I want to know who you guys got. Anyways, over the years we've seen many legends about massive whales that were extremely aggressive. Moby Dick is one of the most famous stories of all time and features a massive whale. This creature however would have put Moby Dick to shame and potentially would have even had it for lunch. Also after it was finished eating Moby Dick it would have happily eaten Captain Ahab and completely demolished his whaling ship. A lot of other entries on this list have had some reported sightings and witnesses but this one we have real fossils to prove its actual existence. I've personally always been a fan of whales, in fact an orca whale is my favorite animal in the whole world but making an orca whale 60 feet with massive teeth is what we have here and and that might be a bit too much for me if I'm being honest. Number 3 on this list is Ninjin. Ninjin are very strange mythical creatures that have only come into the limelight very recently. The rumors and legends of these creatures have largely taken place in Japan. Japanese whale research boats that are sent to the Arctic waters have reported seeing these massive 20 to 30 meter long creatures that are completely white swimming through the ocean. Now, When I first heard that I thought that these things might just be big whales but their shape is unlike anything that we've ever seen before. These creatures are said to look almost human with witnesses saying that they saw massive legs and arms coming from the beast. They also have eyes and a mouth but not many other facial features from the reports. 
For just over the last decade, stories about Ninjin in the Antarctic waters have circulated throughout Japan. One of the most famous was when crew members on the deck of a ship saw what they thought was a submarine in the distance, but when they approached it, realized the creature was alive and watched as it dived quickly underwater. There are some photos that have surfaced on the internet, but nothing that can fully substantiate the claims of this creature's existence. It is also currently unknown if there's only one of these creatures or if there are several of them swimming around the seas. This beast, unlike some of the other creatures that we've talked about, is not just a bigger version of an already existing animal. It isn't just a big snake or a big shark, it's a completely different entity entirely. This makes me think that it would be harder for somebody to confuse a big whale with a creature like this because a whale doesn't look anything like a ninja. Hopefully more sightings and evidence can come to light soon and we can get a definitive confirmation if this thing is real or not. Number two on this list is the Oklahoma octopus. This mythical octopus is said to inhabit some of the bigger lakes in Oklahoma like Lake Thunderbird, Ulaga Lake, and Lake Ten Killer. The sightings indicate that this is a very large aggressive octopus that we wouldn't want to mess with. Many deaths in these lakes have been linked to this octopus or octopi if there are multiple of them. What's very strange about this creature and what makes a lot of people skeptical is that typically octopi don't live in freshwater areas. They're capable of doing it for a short time but they never live there for extended periods. That being said, there have still been multiple sightings and reports of this creature living in these lakes. It's said to be the size of a horse and has a reddish brownish skin tone to it. It eats what any other octopus would eat but has a tendency to kill humans in its area. The reasoning behind this is unknown known though because it doesn't actually eat the humans but only drowns them. Potentially the octopus feels threatened by humans swimming in its water and is very territorial. There's no physical evidence proving the existence of this creature but the rate of drownings in these three lakes that I mentioned earlier, they're far higher than anywhere else in the area. That statistic along with the numerous sightings from fishermen and swimmers have locals believing in the legend of the Oklahoma octopus. Number one on this list is Organism 46B. Organism 46B is believed to be a massive 33 foot long squid like creature that was said to have 14 different tentacles. This thing lived in Vostok Lake which is a subglacial lake located under two entire miles of ice. This creature has the ability to animate its legs after they've been amputated, it's capable of shape shifting, it's extremely intelligent and also extremely hostile and it has the ability to immobilize its prey with a a toxin that it could spray up to 150 feet. We've only actually known about this creature for a few years. Although the Russians initially established an Antarctic base on top of Vostok Lake in 1957, they actually weren't aware that there was a lake beneath them until 1974 and then they weren't able to get to the lake until 2012. It was only after that that they discovered Organism 46B. After they drilled all the way through the ice and got to a point where they could send divers down there, they discovered this creature. Sadly, the discovery was a deadly one though. Dr. Anton Padalka, a researcher at the site, is quoted saying, he tread water wearing a blissful smile as the organism approached him. We watched helplessly as it used its arms to tear off its head, then popped its remains in its mouth. It was as if it had hypnotized him telepathically. This ability to completely lull its prey into a sense of calm is apparently what this creature's venomous spray is capable of doing to people. Padalka had some more interactions with this beast, but it didn't take long before the Russian government came into the mix and sent a specialized team into Vostok Lake to extract the organism. The fact that any of this news even made it to the public is pretty marvelous, considering the Russian government wanted to keep it under wraps as much as they could. Hopefully, there aren't any more of these dangerous beasts lurking in the subglacial waters waiting to strike. Number five on this list is the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, as many people refer to this creature, is said to be a huge, long-necked, almost dinosaur-looking creature that lives in Scotland. This creature of the deep specifically resides in Loch Ness, a 37-kilometer loch located in the Scottish Highlands. The legend of this sea creature went worldwide back in 1933. A photo was released to the public showing a strange creature's head protruding from the water of Loch Ness. The world went into a frenzy after that photo got out and the legend of Nessie began. Ever since that point, many sightings have been reported, other pictures have been taken, and even sonar readings have indicated this creature swimming in the loch. All of that being said though, we've never had indisputable proof that Nessie's real. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nessie is real, but maybe not how you expect. New Zealand scientists have taken samples of the water in Loch Ness and have studied the DNA that they found in it. Professor Neil Gamel, a geneticist, is quoted saying, 
Well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material that says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might be a giant eel. So, the Loch Ness Monster, as we understand it, might not be real, but potentially this loch is full of giant eels that resemble all the features that Nessie's reported as having. Maybe this is why we've had such a hard time proving this myth, because for years, people have been looking for the wrong thing. I really like the legend of the Loch Ness Monster and honestly want it to be true, but if it had to be giant eels, then I think I could accept that as well. Number four on this list is the USS Stein Monster. The USS Stein was a Knox-class destroyer ship in the United States Navy. The ship was eventually decommissioned from the American Navy and was transferred to the Mexican Navy in the 90s. That wasn't before it was attacked by a massive sea monster though. In 1978, the USS Stein was attacked by an unknown entity which we now refer to as the USS Stein Monster. This monster was said to have been a giant, with some people estimating its size up to 150 feet in length. The ship was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it was attacked. Technical difficulties with the ship started going wrong and eventually they brought it back into the port. Upon inspection, the sonar system was completely damaged. There were cuts and gashes over 8% of the ship, with some of them being massively deep. They also found suction cups like those of a squid attached to the ship. After investigation of the suction cups and the gashes, it became clear that what they were attacked by isn't your standard animal. Even a giant squid would have had a hard time doing what the monster did to the ship. Ever since that point, the legend of the USS Stein monster has grown. Obviously, this monster has to be real because it has actually attacked a ship. Sadly, we don't know a whole lot about it though. In truth, we know less about what's on the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. So it's very possible that a creature we aren't familiar with yet is dwelling down there. Number three on this list is Megalodon. Would this list really be complete if I didn't include the ancient king of the sea? Eleanor Imster writes, Scientists think that Megalodon looked like a stockier version of the great white shark, with strong, thick teeth built for grabbing prey and breaking bones. Regarded as one of the largest and most powerful predators who have ever lived, fossil remains of Megalodon suggest that this giant shark reached a length of about 60 feet. Their large jaws could exert a bite force up to 24,000 to 41,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal, guys. Multiple times bigger than the great white sharks we have today. This thing was so big that it would actually eat entire whales. Now, many myths have surrounded Megalodon and its existence since scientists first brought this mammoth of the sea up. Estimates say that Megalodon went extinct roughly 2.6 million years ago, but some people don't buy into that theory. For quite a while now, the legend of a giant shark still living amongst the ocean has had a lot of people wondering if it's possible. If Megalodon was still alive, is it possible that we still wouldn't know about it? How could we miss a creature this giant? How many of them would there be left in the waters? There are surely a lot of questions that come up if you believe Megalodon is still a reality. If this creature was still alive, then people think the Marianas Trench is where it's located, a place so deep and uncharted that it's hard for us to know for sure what's down there. I'm personally not convinced this creature still roams the ocean, but comment down below your thoughts. Is Megalodon still alive? What do you think? Number two on this list is the Kraken. The Kraken is one of the largest sea monsters that is said to exist. It all started in Nordic folklore many hundreds of years ago when sailors told tale of a massive beast that preys upon the waters of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This fearsome beast was said to pull entire ships to their doom and eat every human on board. The first account of the legend was in 1180 by the King of Norway at the time. Since then, sightings of the creature and lore surrounding its capabilities have grown through the years. Fiction writers and movie makers have also latched onto this creature and included it in many stories. As cool as it would be though, to our current knowledge, the Kraken itself isn't real. However, something similar to it definitely is. The Giant Squid. The Giant Squid is a massive squid that's said to be able to grow up to 13 meters in length. Sightings have even put this creature at 20 meters before, but those have never been proven. Even if 13 meters is the maximum length, that's still a large animal and something that would frighten anyone if you're seeing it for the first time. Many experts believe that the legend of the Kraken happened when Norwegian sailors stumbled upon this giant squid, and rather than name it a giant squid, they called it the Kraken. As time went on, the legend spiraled out of control until we got this massive sea monster which attacks boats. Now even though that might be a bit far from the truth, 
Could I believe that there was one giant squid that was potentially bigger than the rest? Absolutely I could. I could also believe that this giant squid might have attacked a ship or two in its time and maybe even brought one down. If it did do all of that, then there really wouldn't be any difference between this squid and the kraken. Either way, if you see a massive sea creature with tentacles coming after you, I'd just swim in the opposite direction. Number one on this list is the Hook Island Sea Monster. It was first spotted by Robert Le Sarek in 1964 off of Hook Island and after he saw the monster, he went on to describe it in detail. He said, it was only when we got to within 20 feet of the serpent that we could see its head clearly. The head was large, about 4 feet from top to bottom with jaws about 4 feet wide. The lower jaw was flat like that of a sandfish. The skin was smooth but rather dull, brownish black in color. The eyes seemed pale green, almost white. The skin looked more like that of a shark than an eel. There were no apparent scales nor did we see any parasites around. We supposed the flexible tail would have shaken any off. There were no fins or spines, nor were there any apparent breathing openings, although there must have been some. Perhaps we didn't see them because our attention was focused mainly on the creature's menacing mouth, the inside of which was whitish. The teeth appeared to be small. A fragment of some dark substance hung from the upper row of teeth, possibly a fish. As the monster was lying on the sandy bottom, we could not see the color of its belly. The creature was about 90 feet long. Behind the head, the body was about 2 feet 4 inches thick and remained that way for about 25 feet. Then it gradually tapered into a whip-like tail. The general color of the body was black with 1 foot wide brownish rings every 5 feet the first starting just behind the head. The skin was smooth but dull. So that's his description and after he and his family saw it, he took some pictures of the creature to prove his claims. We have to remember that these pictures were taken in 1964 and doctoring them would have been far more difficult back then than it is today. I also tend to believe this claim more than most based on the level of detail he described the beast. Obviously it was pretty jarring experience if he was able to describe the creature in that much detail. Since the claims, people have researched Hook Island for this monster, but with no luck. Hopefully one day we can spot this monster again and know for certain that it truly exists. <laughs>